scripture reading is Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 16. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Good morning, everyone. Good to see all of you. What an incredible um, songs that we're saying. I mean, you're, it was absolutely beautiful, and I know the Lord was pleased uh, with it. <clears throat> George Barna is a demographer as well as a social scientist, and what he does is he he goes about the nation making various surveys. He surveys huge corporations like, like Disney or, or Visa. Not only does he do a survey to help show the trends and the health of those corporations, but also he uses some of his profits to uh, determine various kinds of faith trends that are going on within the church and whether the church is making an impact on the kingdom for the Lord's sake. And so he does these surveys. In one of his surveys, he, from it, he uh, wrote a book called Revolutions. And in this book of Revolutions, he talks about a trend that is going on within the church, and he predicts that there is going to be some reshaping going on in, in Christendom worldwide. In the midst of this book here, he says that he has identified 30 million Americans that he deems to be what he calls revolutionaries. Uh, there are interesting people when you begin to think about it. Revolutionaries are people who are very passionate about their faith. They're very committed individuals or people. They have super high expectations for themselves, but not only for themselves, but of other believers. And they have high expectations for the church in, in general. They want more of God in their life. Their lives are, and what they're doing, in, in almost everything that happens within their, their lives. They are returning to what they would call first century lifestyle based on love, on faith, on goodness, on generosity, on kindness, and simplicity. Uh, they seek a more robust faith. They seek one in which they prioritize a transformation in every aspect of their lives. So at their lives and they're saying to themselves where do i need to grow how do i need to become better when it comes to uh, walking this journey as a follower of jesus christ he wrote in his book these words here he says these revolutionaries have no patience or time for churches which are not making an impact for the kingdom which they believe that most do not or that the church does not exist that really is that sold out they do not that do not hold their members to high standards in calling of jesus christ and are this is going to surprise you, at least it, it, me. They are content to be passive recipients rather than active participants as members. And that's interesting to me because they're committed, they're loyal, they have high standards for themselves, they have high standards for you, they have high standards for the church worldwide and so forth. And yet at the same time, they just say, we just want to be passive recipients. We don't want to really engage. In other words, what they're saying is, is that you know, they don't need organized religion or anything that has to do that. And so they've chosen to go it alone by themselves. And so the vast majority of the revolutionaries have left the church because they do not see it adding to their spiritual journey or their relationship with, with God. CNN said that five out of six Americans do not believe the church is needed to grow spiritually or to be close to God. 30 million Americans, five out of six Americans, that's where they are at. That doesn't mean that they're not believers. That doesn't mean that they don't believe that they are Christians. They just don't see value in church. They don't see the value in what you have done this morning. In fact, if they were to put some tags line, they would say something like this. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in a garage makes you a car. Or these words here. If you can get spiritual connection without going to church, why go to church? 
That's where their minds are. Some say that's the millennial mindset. It's a, a predominant uh, American belief in the world that, you know, when it comes down to uh, your faith, it becomes a very private thing. When it comes down to Christianity, well, all that really matters is your relationship with God and not with those who are around you. So revolutionaries, to them, Christianity is all about them. They give little thought to others or who are on the same journey. They're going to go it alone. They are a, not a collective. I mean, there's, it's a group of them, but they're not a, a collective body of people who they believe have been called out and gathered together. They are, really are lone wolves. Their faith is about them. Uh, they're going to go at it by themselves. And so what happens is they begin to ask questions like, well, why church? And probably even more specific is, who needs the church? Well, when you look at the, those kinds of trends, then I think that there are several, at least, uh, vital factors that uh, the vast majority of people who are in this in this category I think they, they really miss and one of them is the fact that Jesus you remember once asked a question who do people say that I am and they gave him another a number of answers and then Peter says you're the Christ the son of the living God and Jesus was pleased with that confession and he said blessed are you Simon Barjona flesh and blood did not reveal this to you but my father who is in heaven and I say to you that you are Peter and upon this rock this bedrock confession that I'm the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build my church. Jesus came to build a church, a collective body of people that would be called out of the world. The word church is the word ekklesia. It's, it's a two-part Greek word, ek, which means out or out of, and kaleo, which means to be called. And so Jesus says, I'm going to build a people who are called out of the world, and they're going to be called into something. So what have we been called out of? What have we been called out of the world? What have we been called into if not the church it itself? When you look at such passages as Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 and then verse 41, and I could have had verse 47, after Peter had preached the gospel sermon about Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection, and so forth, on that day the church began. The Bible says that they were pricked in their hearts, and they said to the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter told them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He went on to encourage them more so, but as you got down to verse 41, it says, those who gladly received his word were baptized, and the Lord added on that day about 3,000 souls of men. And so God was adding, what was he adding them to? He has added them to this church that he'd say he was going to build. As you get down to verse 47, there it says that the Lord was adding to their number, the church number, day by day, those who were being saved. And so this morning, I want to talk to you about why church. What are some of the fundamental factors of the church? Well, one of the fundamental factors is, is this. The fundamental fact of life is that we were created with a need for one another. We're created with a need for having relationships. We are relational individuals. Now, it's true that when you talk about relationships, that sometimes relationships are the problem. That most of the problems that we have in life have to do with relationships, whether it's your spouse or, or whether it's your parents or your children or whether it's a friend or whether it's a coworker or a boss. Most of the problems we have have to do with relationships. But relationships are part of who we are. Why? Because it's the center of who we are. God has created us to be social beings. That's just the, the way it is. We need one another when it comes down to mental and emotional and physical as well as spiritual growth. People cannot live in isolation. That's not what they're about. Even at the very beginning, Jesus, uh, God, uh, or writing God's words over in Genesis, the second chapter, he looked at the man, the man's in the garden, he said, it's not good for man to be alone. Well, why wasn't it good for man to be alone? It was because we were hardwired to be in relationship with one another. We were designed to have fellowship, to have a sense of belonging, of being a part of something. Rick Warren, in one of his books, said these words, we are created for community, fashioned for fellowship, and formed for family, and none of us can fulfill God's purposes by ourselves. In other words, what he's saying, and what the Bible's saying, is that the relationship that you have with Jesus Christ is personal, <clears throat> but it was never intended to be private. 
Never was it intended to be private. It's always been not only a vertical thing where we're in relationship with God, but it's horizontal when we're in relationship with one another. And the church is that which meets that thing almost perfectly. So three things very quickly that I want to share with you that I think that uh, allows us to have this relationship that you can't do on your own, that you can't do the same way as we answer the question, why church? Well, number one, when you talk about why church is that of, of fellowship. When I say fellowship, I'm talking more than just having potluck dinners or sitting over, standing over coffee or sitting around a table drinking coffee or, or having a conversation or things like that. When I talk about fellowship, I'm talking about a New Testament fellowship that shares in life. It shares pain. It shares disappointments. It shares frustrations of, of life as well as joys and successes and laughter that is involved in life all in the context of a faith in Jesus Christ. It's a fellowship that's bound together by the blood of Jesus Christ that seals us together with one another. Jesus said, I will build my church, would purchase it with his blood, sealing us together as a unit. So we need fellowship in order to survive and to be enriched. In fact, a lot of scientific studies have looked into human relationships and so forth and what they've discovered is man from being a, a very small infant all the way up into being elderly or say, elderly people do not do well when it comes down to isolation a baby who is left by itself and only just fed and maybe had its diaper changed but is not held and caressed and kissed and talked to and cooed at and so forth uh, they are they are disabled in so many different kinds of ways, and that tends to be all the way up even to the elderly years when we start to get you know some start to be shut in in life and aren't able to get out into community and so forth. They still need people that care for them, who still provide for their needs, who still talk to them and visit them and hold them and hug them and touch them. That's who we are. We need that in life to survive. The church helps in that area in so many kinds of ways. In Hebrews, the 10th chapter, in verses 24 and 25, the other writer says this, these words, let us, that's the church uh, and Christian, let us consider how to stimulate, how to stir one another up, how to spur one another on to love and to good works. Do not forsake the assembling of ourselves, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, even more as we see the day drawing near or the draw day coming close. And so he's talking about the idea of what is church about? Church is about a fellowship where we stimulate each other to do good things. We encourage one another to do good things, to, to, to hang in there, even in, in times that are rough. The Bible, you know, in, in, when it comes to talking about one another, some say that there are 42 one another passages. Some have expanded it all up to a hundred passages to say that we are to love one another, to care for one another, to encourage one another, to serve one another, to be kind to one another, to be compassionate to one another, to be tender-hearted to one another, to bear one another's burdens, to endure one another, to persevere with one another. I mean, it just goes on and on in there, one, one another passage after another, and it's done in community. It's done in the church. So why the church? The church exists because of the fellowship that it provides to each and every one of us. In fact, life without relationships becomes something that is meaningless. But life lived in the midst of a relationship becomes rich and becomes meaningful to each and every one of us. And the church, it provides this better than any other organization, any a club, any institution. The church accepts all walks of life into its midst. And if you were to look around at uh, yourselves and see all the different walks of life that we come from, here we are together and we're bound together in this church by the blood of, of Jesus Christ. It's always on terms, of course, which means if there is sin in our lives, that has to be ejected or rejected and so forth in terms of lifestyle and so forth. But God accepts us all in his terms according to the blood of Christ. So why the church? Fellowship. Secondly, why the church? Well, worship becomes a paramount part. Anthropologists, they've done studies over this as they've looked at man throughout the ages. And what they've seen that throughout the ages, mankind seems to have this innate thing within them where they have to worship. Mankind has an innate need to worship, a desire to connect with God. Augustine, who was a first, second century church father, he said these words, that mankind is created with a vast uh, void within himself that only Jesus Christ can fill. 
There, there is this God-shaped hole in each and every one of us that only God can fill, and he can only fill it as we come close to him and begin to worship him. So worship, when you think about it, is not about having our needs met, though sometimes we do meet needs. It's about giving ourselves to someone or something else that is bigger than our, ourselves. And the fact of the matter is this. No matter who you are, you're going to give yourself to something or to someone. The only question is this, what? What are you going to give yourself to? Jesus said over in John, the fourth chapter, verses 24 down through about verse 28, and that section of scripture says, God desires people who will worship him and who worship him in spirit and truth. God only desires it, man of us the church is where that happens we we become those who collectively gather together to worship but when you talk about worship worship can be seen in two different ways one way is this worship is something that is personal to each and every one of us there is a time where worshiping god is very recreative when you talk about maybe being in in the mountains or on a lakeside but worship becomes very personal in other words, it's, it's personal that there are going to be times when I just need to be by myself where I open up God's word for myself and I read from it. And not only do I read from it, but I begin to meditate. I mull it over in my mind, try to think about what are some ways that I can make this applicable in my life? What are some things that I'm reading here that I can apply to my life? You need times of reading by yourself and meditating by yourself. You need times when you sing by yourselves. Most of us, if I were to ask you, how many of you think you have a great voice, raise your hand, very few of you would do so. Most of us don't think we have good voices. When we all sing together, it's a great harmony and so forth, but we don't think of ourselves that way. Singing to the Lord when you're on your lonesome and by yourself, well, you can use whatever voice you have. God doesn't care. He just cares that you sing uh, to him and you can do that by having a hymn book with you songs that you have memorized maybe you have a a worship cd but singing praise to him and sometimes prayer is important just to pray by yourself where you enter into your closet if you will and you spend some time praying about the things that are going on in your life and it can happen anywhere you can personally worship god while you're at the kitchen sink washing dishes while you're sitting on the couch folding your clothes you can worship god when you driving down the road you can worship god you know when you're sitting at your desk at work you teens can worship god when you're sitting at your desk at school no one can say you know listen god is out of the school no god is only out of the school if we put him out of the school we can worship him anywhere we can worship it on the fish bank we can worship him around the campfire we can worship him listen we can worship god personal worship is a good thing but then there is corporate worship and that's what we're here doing this morning and that's a commanded thing that's not a suggested thing god knows that you need other people of like faith who are going down the same path or going down on the same journey together with one another as we deal with this life and as we move towards heaven god knows not only do you need vertical worship but he knows you need horizontal worship and that's why the bible says speak to one another in psalms hymns and spiritual songs that's why we gather around the lord's supper to remember what we all have in common in the Lord. You know, so corporate worship is important. And that's why the writer of Hebrews says, do not forsake the assembling of ourselves. The word forsake means do not abandon the assembling of ourselves, as is the habit of some, but encourage one another. Times are going to get tough. Hang in there with one another. You need to be with each other. Why the church? Well, you need the church because of the fellowship that it offers. We are relational people we need to belong to something why the church we need to worship god not only personally but individually some might say well listen i can worship god just as well on the mountainside as i can here in the church building well to some degree that is is true but if it were the truth why would there be the church why would jesus establish the church he knows you need it why the church worship here's the last reason and that is the church provides a mission something that reaches beyond ourselves into those who are around us not as passive recipients not as those who are not connected to others but as those who are engaged with one another on a common purpose of reaching out to a world that is lost mankind has two problems they have a sin problem all of sin and falls short of the glory of god 
And two, we all have a grave problem. We're all going to die. Hebrews 10, 9 and verse 27 says, it's given for man once to die. And then after this comes a judgment. So we have a sin problem and we have a grave problem. And Jesus Christ was sent to this world to answer both those problems. And so that's why it's called good news. You have good news to share with your friends and your neighbors that, listen, God is taking care of the two problems. You may not think you have a problem, but the Bible says you do. The church becomes that impetus that allows us, this tool that allows us to collectively reach out into the world in very good kinds of, of ways. That's what the church is about. So why church matters? Church matters because it's where meaningful relationships are made. It's where worship happens. It's where ministry is encouraged. It's where we're reminded about our mission, why we are here as far as why we didn't just leave this planet the day that we became Christians. Jesus left us here for the mission of reaching out into a world that is lost. Church matters. It matters because the church makes it possible for people to have a real encounter with Jesus Christ. I want you to think about that. As you think about yourself, why the church? What does the church mean to me? Now, listen, I gave you just three reasons why it matters. There's dozens more, but I know that you're anxiously wanting to hear what Dave has to say to us about the 2019 budget. So we certainly want to give him time to do that. But let's sing a song of invitation. If you need to respond at that time, won't you do so? And then Dave is going to come up and share with us some of the matters of, of church that we have to talk about. So if you'd all stand and let's all sing. As I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come. 